So I am a polymer scientist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and at North Carolina State University. And my research group and I are very interested in, in fact, my, I might even say inspired by, the physical properties of cells. Physical properties, things like size and shape and elasticity are very interesting to us. Take, for example, this cancer cell. Did you know that malignant human mammary cells are 10 times softer than regular cells? They're more elastic. And that metastatic cancer cells are 10 times softer than regular cancer cells. And this softness is a, this, this elasticity, if you will, is derived from genetic changes that change the cytoskeleton and make these cells softer. And in fact, elasticity is a phenotype of cancer. And this allows these cells to migrate and get into physical locations that they're normally not found in. And we're very interested in the structure property relationships associated with elasticity and size and shape. Bacteria are very interesting objects to study. They come in a profound range of sizes and shapes and elasticity. I love this quote here. To be brutally honest, few people care that bacteria have different shapes, which is a shame because bacteria seem to care very much. <laughs> and it's true, their, their, their various sizes and shapes play a really important role in their function. Uh, issues related to access to nutrients. The surface to volume ratio is really important because diffusion plays a really important role at this length scale. Their symmetry is really important for, upon cell division for equipartitioning of nucleic, mater uh, nucleic material during cell division. 90% of the motile bacteria are rod-like. And the balance of these sizes and shapes really play an important role in the environments they're found in. Take, for example, uh, m bacteria that are found in really viscous environments, like a mucosal membrane. Not only are they rod-like, but they're helical. And people believe that the translation of bacteria is much easier in viscous environments if they're helical. And we heard a little bit of this story yesterday on the macroscopic scale. And so we're really interested in these aspects. And so we're interested in, can we use biomimicry to make better medicines and better vaccines? The challenge, though, is how can we fabricate structures at these length scales to mimic size, shape, and elasticity? And if you look at the different areas of manufacturing or fabrication in the nano world, there's basically two groups of fabrication technologies out there. There would be the bottom-up approaches. This is mostly the world of chemistry, uh, where molecules are self-assembled into larger structures, uh, like emulsions and liposomal structures. These are small structures, but they're often spherical with no shape control and very polydisperse. If you start moving towards bottom-up approaches where one has shape control, you often lose the chemical control. These are silver crystals that are in arrested crystal growth, and they, they, they form beautiful triangles, but they're now silver, and you don't have much latitude for making things out of organic materials that would be more useful. The whole other world of fabrication at the nanoscale is what would be called the top-down approaches. And these are, the, these are the approaches that underpin the semiconductor industry used to make arbitrary features on surfaces uh, for the integrated circuits, kind of like Jay just showed us. And so what my group is interested in is can we harness or co-opt the fabrication techniques of the microelectronics industry to make organic particles where we have the control of size shape and, and elasticity. And so it's connecting these two worlds. Now we heard a lot about Moore's Law this week, and everyone's quite familiar with this. A couple different definitions, but certainly one is the doubling of the number of transistors every 18 months. And a, a computer chip hasn't changed very much over the years. They're all about the same size, 
and the transistors are all pretty much the same, they just got a lot smaller. And you look back 40 years ago, the number of transistors that one could fit onto a microchip was about a couple of thousand transistors because the minimum feature size of the transistor back in the early 70s was about the size of a single cell, about 10 microns. Today you buy a computer chip, they're, sa they're still about the same size, but now they've been able to cram billions of transistors in the same relative area because the minimum feature size is now down around the size of a virus particle. So in 40 years, Moore's law has gone from the size of a single cell down to the size of a virus particle. So we're in a regime that allows us to begin thinking about mimicking bacteria and, uh, and viruses. But the challenge is, how do we actually fabricate them? Most of the microelectronics are made out of silicon and metal, not out of organics. So we developed a technique we call print. Basically, it's a molding technique. We lithographically define or etch features into a wafer. These are 100 nanometer features, uh, very small structures. Put this in context, a red blood cell would be about 8,000 nanometers in diameter. These are about 100 nanometers. We etch a pattern. My group developed a material we call liquid Teflon. It's like a silicone oil, but it's highly fluorinated, non-stick like Teflon. We pour it onto this pattern wafer, and it will wet every nook and cranny of that wafer at the nanoscale. And then we shine a light on it, and we're able to peel off a mold or a membrane that represents with very high fidelity the features in that silicon wafer. And I have an example of this membrane here. And you can tell the patterns. Maybe we can dim the lights a little bit. But you can see the diffraction associated with these features uh, on this piece of film. So this film allows us and my students to make particles of controlled size and shape. And what we basically do is shown in this illustration if we pour that liquid on, we solidify it. It now looks like an ice cube tray on a nanoscale. And using a roll-to-roll -roll process, we can fill the cavities without wetting the land area between the cavities, solidify that liquid into a particle, and then harvest them on another film, dissolve away the adhesive, and we've made our particles of controlled size and shape. And this is what our particles look like. So we have complete control over the size and shape of these particles. We can engineer them to have all sorts of chemical properties based on the chemistry we choose. And not only can we make the particles of uniform chemistry within a particle, but we can spatially, spatially chemically control where the chemistry is within each particle. And this gives us a lot of latitude for controlling structure and function. So what we're interested in is how do these physical properties of these particles behave on cellular inter interactions and biodistribution? And clearly, this depends on how we're administering the particles, what dosage form, whether they're inhalation, intravenous, intramuscular, you name it. And so let me start with a couple of different dosage forms. Let me start with inhalation, respiratory diseases, whether you're trying to get particles into the lung for treating cystic fibrosis, or asthma, or maybe you're doing intranasal delivery to access the CNS directly. This is a, the, the, the state of the art for particle technology in all today's current pharmaceutical products. There is no control of size and shape uh, to the level that is, we believe is necessary. So are there roles that size and shape can play on aerosol-like characteristics? Are there things that we can look at in nature that says shape plays an important role in aerodynamic characteristics? And certainly there are many examples. And we look at some of the details of a simple thing like a helicopter maple seed and how it's an auto-rotating object in a low-velocity airstream that creates a, a leading-edge vortex, creates aerodynamic lift, something we all recognize. Can we inspire some of those into our particles? And in fact, we can mold particles that are auto-rotating objects in low-velocity airstreams. Uh, we can mimic things like pollen. This should be the, the state bird of North Carolina. Um, <laughs> the ability to disperse these objects is very important to go from a quiescent state to be able to travel. 
and we can model their aerodynamic characteristics and change their sedimentation rates and change their deposition profiles. And so we can interface between computational fluid dynamics and these shapes. And what's really valuable is that the particles can be pure pharmaceutical ingredients, things like antibacterial, antimicrobial, enzymes that, that can chew up uh, nucleus and lower the mucus and, and, uh, and lower the viscosity of mucus. And we can look at and go in vivo, and we can begin looking at different deposition patterns depending on a particular size and shape. So we can now get regional deposition in airways by engineering characteristics of particles such as they can deposit when we want them and where we want them. Now, we know that pathogens invade cells, and uh, there is a lot of interest in whether it's uh, accessing tuberculosis in, uh, um, in macrophages or E. coli in the cells that line the, the bladder that lead to bladder infections. And there would be a lot of interest in understanding the role of size and shape on how particles enter cells. And we now are pursuing a library of our shapes and looking at the fundamental details of how this parameter impacts cellular internalization, not only the, the rate of it, but the detailed biological mechanism and the intracellular trafficking. And what we now know is that we can target and detarget certain cell types by using a variety of different shapes so that we can fill, facilitate uptake within cells uh, or not, depending on what our therapeutic interests are. These are ovarian cancer cells, and these are our particles uh, inside these cells. And wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be powerful if we could, in fact, use these in a way that we could delete or terminate these cells, much like a Trojan horse-like approach? And so we're now using these characteristics of size and shape, but now we're coupling it to chemistry so that we can take advantage of the unique intracellular environment. Inside a cell, it has a lower pH than outside of a cell. And so what we now do is design particles. The ones shown in red are resistant to acidic degradation, but the ones shown in green are very susceptible to acidic degradation. And once these particles enter the cell, the ones that are designed to fall apart do fall apart, and the ones that don't, don't. And we can control that. So what we can now do is load these particles up with a, um, a chemotherapy agent. We can do intracellular delivery. The particles fall apart, release the chemotherapy agent, and we can now trigger apoptosis or cell death. And we can, only, we can do this only inside the cell. Only when the particle gets in a cell does it release its cargo. So a true Trojan horse-like approach. What about mechanics? Red blood cells are really interesting objects. Red blood cells are extremely deformable. Our red blood cells circulate for about 120 days. Uh, they're very soft. They undergo 100% strain or double in length and squeeze through pores in the sinusoids of our spleen, pop out the other side and recirculate. And they do that for about 120 days. But at that point, they start getting stiff when they get older, much like a lot of us do. And these red blood cells can't fit through the spleen any longer. And that's how the body will physically remove an old red blood cell and let young red blood cells pass. So it's called mechanobiology. Well, we've been now able to mimic and fabricate hydrogels that have the same size and same shape as real red blood cells. And we can systematically vary their elasticity such that these particles can flow through these gates in a microfluidic channel that mimic the barriers that are in our bodies. And you just see how elastic these particles are. And once, once we match the modulus of a real red blood cell, uh, we can begin going uh, in vivo. This is an example of an intravital microscope that's just sitting on the earlobe of a mouse. And we inject our particles. And we're looking at the capillaries in the ear. And we have a fluorescent dye on these particles. And you can see the particles flowing through the bloodstream. And these become long circulating particles. And so we now match the size and shape. Uh, but we also match the elasticity. And we can now have particles that circulate for a long time. 
So inspiration from red blood cells becomes really valuable. We're beginning to do this into other sizes and other shapes by matching mechanics. These are particles on the nanoscale. These are 80 nanometers in diameter. Remember, red blood cells, 8,000 nanometers. Uh, we can begin mimicking things like bloodborne bacteria, where they're often very elastic and very uh, rod-like. And we can now make particles that look just like those. And so we're using these as ways to uh, enhance deposition profiles. And so this is just a series of experiments where we vary the size and the shape. We inject them in animals, and we begin looking at where they go. These are just replicas for different organs. And you can see patterns emerging. So we're using sizes and shapes as a passive characteristic to, to facilitate deposition profiles that we want. And we now can load these with drugs, like chemotherapy agents. And now we've been able to succeed where we can get 20 times more drug deposited in a tumor with, these, with this approach relative to the standard of care drug when it's now packaged into these types of carriers. So size and shape can play an important role. Let me talk about vaccines. Pathogens come in all sorts of different sizes and shapes, and a range of beautiful shapes are available uh, and very inspiring. And some are, are not too different. Avian influenza doesn't look too different than Ebola, uh, but it's got much more elastic and it and obviously has some unique characteristics. When you look at the vaccines, the first generation vaccines were live attenuated whole pathogens. These objects have size, shape, and surface chemistries that are unique to the pathogen. And people would give these as the vaccine, and your body would respond really well with these live attenuated uh, pathogens, but you also had safety issues. You could get the disease. So people have gotten away from live attenuated pathogens as a vaccine and has moved on to subunit vaccines, where we basically strip off maybe some of the viral coat or maybe strip off a polysaccharide off the flagella of a bacterium and just give these molecules as the vaccine. Well, we know that the body processes molecules very different than it processes objects. And so our simple hypothesis is, can we recapitulate something that looks more like the pathogen by combining these molecules with replicas of these uh, uh, pathogens and mimic their size and elasticity and shape. And so this is actually our first product that we've put into the clinic and our team at Liquidia, which was spun off my, out of my laboratory. These are some of our particles. These are made out of the same material as a bioabsorbable suture or same as uh, Abbott's new bioabsorbable stent combined with the same vi influenza virus uh, or influenza vaccine that you and I all get, these are molecules, within uh, just a few minutes, 90% of these molecules will absorb on the surface of these particles. And when we do that, we get about a 12-fold increase in immune response. So it's a more effective delivery of these biologics to the immune system. So we're firm believers in a role that size and shape can play uh, in bet making better medicines and better vaccines. And the fabrication technologies of the microelectronics industry are, th are the inspiration for what we do. And we all know how important and pervasive microelectronics fabrication is in our lives. But I would argue that the opportunity for taking the fabrication techniques from microelectronics and moving them into biologics that would be important for making new medicines, new vaccines, perhaps synthetic blood, or maybe even consumer products and cosmetics, opens up a new frontier in bringing microelectronics processing all the way into a wide range of new opportunities for directly impacting medicine. Thank you for listening.